In this session I'm going to be talking about financing issues and how it's possible to square the circle of providing universal access to secondary schooling at sustainable levels of cost. Cost per student as a proportion of GDP per capita need to be somewhere in the range of 15% or less at primary school level, 25% or less at lower secondary level and 40% at upper secondary level for a system to be able to provide universal access at affordable cost. Though there is some room to manoeuvre on the margin with those figures, a departure which is more than small will create equations which mean that unrealistic proportions of GDP would have to be allocated to the education system. Another rule of thumb is that cost per secondary school student should generally be less than twice those at primary level and even 50% and more is, uh, is probably both possible and um, desirable. This does not mean degrading quality, it simply means being more efficient in using the resources that are available and asking hard questions about why it should be that secondary schools are much more expensive than primary schools when the main costs are in teachers' salaries. And the general principle should be that effective teachers are being paid fairly similar amounts uh, whether they're working with primary or secondary school students. Teacher salaries are of course a very important part of the cost equation and the largest element. Another way of looking at this is that teacher salaries at primary school level cannot be much more than about four times GDP per capita or at secondary level about five times GDP per capita for the financing to be sustainable within an envelope which is realistic. Alongside that the contribution made by for-profit fee-paying schools is unlikely to be much more than about 20% of enrolment and 20% of the nominal costs of providing universal access. The reasons for this go back to teachers' salaries on the one hand and household incomes and their distribution on another. The details are too complex to elaborate here but that is the conclusion that many people would reach that as systems develop, somewhere between 20 and 30% of enrolment is probably the upper limit for fee-paying, self-financing, private schooling. Teacher class ratios need to be less than two to one. Some secondary school systems are very inefficient in the sense of having more than two teachers available for every class which is currently being taught. It's not only the people-teacher ratio that matters, it's also the class, the teacher class ratio that matters in terms of what is delivered and how much teachers have time on task. Wherever possible, of course, cost recovery options should be used but coupled with pro-poor subsidies. Secondary school systems generally are regressive. They're inhabited by children from upper quintile households more than lower quintile households. It is appropriate where it is possible to operate various kinds of means-tested fee structures, payment structures, which encourage those who can afford to pay to make a contribution. But it's not appropriate to apply flat rate fees across a population because these will exclude. Pro-poor subsidies are necessary and services which are free at the point of service delivery are essential if expanded access is to be equitable. The growth rate in participation in secondary school should not be more than GDP growth plus perhaps 5%. To sustain higher rates of growth for any length of time is to challenge the capacity of systems to grow, adapt and maintain their quality, to provide sufficient physical resources and to supply schools and facilities with an adequate number of trained teachers. When we model the financing gaps to universalise secondary schooling across Africa, the numbers we come up with are typically between 10 and 20 billion dollars annually on the recurrent side. These financing gaps can be addressed and any country that spends more than five or six percent of GDP per capita on its education system with an appropriate cost structure can find ways to universalise access through to the end of the lower secondary cycle and in some cases through to upper secondary. Real economic growth of course increases domestic revenue 
you can increase the proportion of GDP allocated to the education system and you can change the subsectoral allocation. There are some countries which spend more on their university system than on all their secondary schools. This cannot be right. It should be possible to develop progressive funding systems that do seek to capture more of the cost of provision from those who can afford to pay in the top quintile or the top two quintiles and transfer the benefits of subsidised places to those who can't afford to pay from the bottom quintile households. It is of course also possible to address the financing gaps by attracting greater volumes of external assistance. But as with many other kinds of aid, this should always be coupled with clear pathways forward, which use the opportunity of external assistance to catalyse change towards a sustainable model of financing that sooner or later requires no external assistance. With increasing internal efficiency and reducing cost per student, there's not one way of doing this, but many. It is true that far more children could experience secondary schooling at affordable levels of cost.